नमो भगवते वसुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वसुदेवाय I bow to the Lord Vasudeva and in you. I would like to read a very interesting passage today on Kundalini. Let me explain first what Kundalini is for those of you who don't know, and I imagine all of you have heard the word at least. But when the energy comes into the body, it enters through the medulla oblongata, goes to the brain and down the spine, out into the nerves. <coughs> now, it becomes locked in a pole at the base of the spine. The north pole of the body is the top of the head. The base of the spine is the south pole. And that energy has to be released. And yoga practices in general often teach you various techniques for helping to raise the kundalini, whether through breathing exercises, through asanas, and so on. But it's a very important thing to understand also that kundalini is not just a question of techniques. There are techniques, <coughs> for example, tantric practices often enable you to raise the kundalini quickly, but you can rise quickly and fall quickly. The important thing is to rise and stay up, obviously. And for that, you need to have the basis in moral law. That's why the basis of Patanjali's entire system is the yamas niyamas, to act rightly, to be kind, to be harmless, to be truthful, to be honest, to be devotional and, and uh, clean in body and mind, and all the various five not yamas, five niyamas, these are something that Yoganandaji was addressing in this particular passage here in Conversations with Yogananda. This is saying number 270. I have too many sayings to read in all, for all of these things, so I skip sometimes. The last was 263, I think. Of the kundalini force, the, ener the energy that is locked at the base of the spine, the Master said one day, when one thinks good thoughts, the kundalini automatically starts moving upward. When one thinks evil thoughts, it moves downward. When one hates others or has wrong thoughts about them, it moves down. And when one loves others or thinks kindly about them, it moves up. Kundalini is not awakened by yoga techniques alone. This is a very important thing to understand. Many people think that only by practicing techniques they will get there. I talked yesterday, or the last time, that we had the, the, uh, this lesson about the importance of expanding your consciousness. There is a definite correlation between raising the consciousness and expanding it. The higher the consciousness, it's, it's interesting, it's the way that uh, um, yoga teaches that the, you have your consciousness is enclosed in sheaths, koshas it's called in Sanskrit. And when you raise your consciousness, gradually you remove those koshas. You know, in the early stages of life, there isn't even a spine to come up. An amoeba doesn't have a spine. When you develop a spine, you notice that the animals have tails. Those tails are indication that the energy is still far down. It's moving away from the, from the spine, from the top of the head into the downward moving kundalini. But uh, when you can bring that energy gradually upward, it comes up through the vertebrates, vertebrates to the point where the higher it goes and the more it passes up through the different centers or chakras in the spine, the more it begins to, sh sh to, un sh to sh unshed, to shed I should say, the qualities that were keeping it Tied. We've been sort of like a, a butterfly in a cocoon. And first of all, it becomes just a caterpillar. Then it forms a co cocoon around itself. And all of a sudden, after some time, the butterfly bursts out. So we are like that. We have been in a cocoon of delusion. Bit by bit, we, are, we learn how to get rid of that cocoon 
And as life evolves, more or less automatically up to the human level, but at the human level, then comes the time when you have to begin to use your own intelligence, your own discrimination, and that's when you can help to consciously raise your kundalini, not just by um, technique, but by remembering that the more you think kind thoughts about other people, it's not only that your consciousness expands, but it, it expands by the very process of raising the energy to levels where there is less and less of that cocoon around you. When you can bring the energy here to the point between the eyebrows, from here it passes through a subtle passage to the top of the head, and then you attain the enlightened state. But you have to do it, achieve it through here. If you try to do it from here, you do from ego. You see, the ego, I'm teaching you some subtle things here, so listen carefully. Don't go get yourself a Coke from the fridge while I'm talking today. The ego is centered here at the point between the eyebrows where the energy first enters the body. That is why when people are proud or when you flatter them and they, so they, they move their heads in such a way as to indicate that their energy is centered here in the medulla oblongata. Now a master's energy is centered here, his consciousness is centered here. But that's why if you look at rock stars and people who are much before the public and everybody's praising them and so on, you see them with their heads like this, or people who are very successful in business or whatever, they have this very strong ego which pulls, it's a tension that pulls the energy back here. This is why the universal gesture in all countries of humility and respect is a bow, releasing the energy, the tension back here at the back of the head, at the, uh, in, in, the, in the back of the neck, and letting it go. But the idea of it is not just to lower yourself, but to bring your energy here. When you, in meditation, can release the energy at the medulla oblongata and direct it to this point, this is the proper way to awaken toward the uh, sahasrara or the thousand petal lotus at the top of the, top of the head. If you try to go from the medulla straight to here, then there's some imbalance. It doesn't work right. You have to get the sixth chakra, which is the medulla, at its positive pole. This is not a separate center from this one. The point between the eyebrows is the same center. It's just the positive pole of that center. When you can direct all your energy there, when you feel this is a very important thing. Try to become sensitively aware of it in yourself. When you feel any kind of tension in the medulla, when you become too conscious of yourself, too either in a negative inferiority complex or superiority complex, both are bad. You need to relax that energy from here and direct it to this point. When you can really feel that this is where it is centered, that is when you are ready to go toward the heights. There was a disciple of Yogananda's, my Guruji, um, who wanted, he was highly advanced, and he kept wanting him to, uh, wanting the Guru to give him an experience of samadhi. And my Guru finally said to him one time, because this, this disciple had almost backed him into a corner and insisted, I want this now. My Guru looked at him and he said, are you ready for it? And the disciple suddenly realized, no, he wasn't. He lowered his eyes. He said, I, I guess not, sir. No, he wasn't ready. There was still ego there. He had quite a bit of ego, in fact, if I recall him well. I do recall him well. And with that ego, if you try to go into this consciousness, there's an imbalance. You have to get yourself properly aligned, and then you can go up to the sahasrada. Then you are ready to go into samadhi, Otherwise, a high experience can be an actually uh, damaging thing for you spiritually. It can give you a big ego. Many people on the path fall. Even after they reach samadhi, they can fall. They have to go beyond sabhikalpa samadhi to that point where there is no sense of ego at all. In sabhikalpa, there's still that thought that I, Jim Brown or Ashok or whatever you want to call yourself, the 
infinite but nevertheless still real Jim Brown, Rarashoka, that kind of consciousness will bring you back to this body again and again. You have to get rid of any thought that you exist separate from God. That takes some time to convince the mind that you really are. You don't exist except as an instrument, a manifestation of that infinite one. He is your reality. He is the reality. You and I don't have a separate existence. It's all a dream. We seem real, and we are real, but not as we think we are. When you look at somebody else, you think, I am looking at another human being. I love you. I hate you. These attitudes of I and you are not the reality. When you can reach that point, and this is what I saw in my Guruji, that he never had the thought of I. There was never any consciousness of, you could see it in his eyes. You look at worldly people's eyes, and they, there's always a, uh, you can always see the ego there, liking this, disliking that, wanting this, not wanting that, feeling praised, feeling humiliated. All these things are written in people's eyes. One time somebody asked my guru, can you tell by just looking at people how advanced they are? My guru chuckled, he said it incidentally. And you can tell somewhat without being as advanced as he, just by looking at people. Some people, they just almost reek of ego. And others, there's very little. In him, in my guru, I never saw any of that consciousness. It was always he. He was the one who did everything through him. We need to reach that point. And the physical way of doing it is, first of all, raising the kundalini. And that means having kind thoughts toward others, having supportive thoughts toward others, having wholesome thoughts, devotion to God. All of these things are essential. And if you don't do that, <coughs> then you will find that, that uh, even if you can advance in experiences, Still, you will have to fall. <coughs> I have met too many people who think that spirituality is all a matter of manifestations, of having this miraculous power and that miraculous power. And you'll find people who like to go to saints and, oh, he has this city and he has this city. That's not what it's all about. This is actually one of the really wonderful things about Sanatana Dharma, the teachings of India. It's the truth everywhere. It's not just in India, but it's, this is the only place where it's really taught that the goal of life is moksha. The goal of life is liberation from this ego, not just dancing in Vaikuntha around Krishna, the Rasha Lila that the Vaishnavas dream of. It's, that's still not the answer. You have to merge into that infinite one and become that. And it is true that at that level you may also want to come down and enjoy that Rasha Lila. You may enjoy that, that uh, I and thou relationship, but from a level of coming down to enjoy it and then going back into that infinite one is altogether than different from being stuck in this. You have to have these kind, this kind consciousness toward all, this expansive consciousness toward all, this recognition that all are a part of you. And then... What you need to do is bring the kundalini up. Yes, there are techniques. Kriya Yoga is very important for that. Deep breathing exercises, sitting absolutely still. This is the teaching of Patanjali in his, his uh, Eightfold Path. First of all, he teaches Yama and Niyama, then he teaches Asana. Asana does not mean the physical postures. It means being able to sit still with a straight spine. The asanas developed out of that idea, but they were not the intention of Patanjali. Then comes pranayama, control of the energy, so that you can withdraw the energy from the body, up the spine, up into the infinite. Then come the stages of dhyana, dharana, and samadhi. Pratyahara comes first, interiorizing the thoughts, so that all your thoughts, all your energy, everything is directed inward. But then you need to constantly, in a physical way also, feel that your energy is not here, but here. This is why it's very important all day long, if you can, to try to keep your consciousness 
centered here. Man, chant a mantra, just chant Om if you like, or Om Guru, or Sri Ram, Jai Ram, any mantra that you have. Concentrate it here and direct all your energy there. Direct it especially from the heart up there, the energy of the heart as it teaches in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Take the energy of the heart like the, like the petals of a lotus, direct all that energy upward so that your feelings and your desires are all focused upward. Then focus them here and you will find that the more that your energy becomes drawn to this center, the more you become free, the more you no longer feel a need for things, for approval, for um, people liking you or disliking you. It doesn't really matter anymore. You know that you have one beloved and he is infinite. And when people try to hurt you, remember, they can't hurt you forever. You are a child of the infinite. That is your only reality. Let me sing a song to you, or let us sing a song to you through our singers called The Song of the Nightingale. Joy to you. Nightingale, nightingale, sing of joy through the night. Teach my heart to impart everywhere. Sing of moon rays on the rain, sing that love's not in vain. Every grief, every wrong has its ending in song. Nightingale, nightingale. Sing of joy through the night. Teach all men how to sing clouds of gloom into light. Without silence, what is song? Without night, where is dawn? Were it not for men's woes, who would smile? Nightingale, nightingale. 